today in our Holy Gospel, the Herodians and the disciples of the Pharisees come to Jesus out of malice, and they come to him to test him, to ask him, who should we render our homage to, to Caesar or to God? They did this to entrap him, right? We see as we continue to the conclusion of um, the liturgical year leading up to Christ the King, we'll see that they continue to try and plot and attack Jesus. They continue to try and trap him and test him. But of course, God cannot be thwarted. He knows their malice, and so he tells them whose image is on the coin. Caesar's, they say, because they can't lie. He says, render unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. This little test is something that continues to plague us as Catholics, especially here in America. We try to test God. God, will you preserve America? God, will you preserve our liberties? God, will you preserve what the forefathers have built up? The hard truth is that Jesus did not promise that the gates of hell would not prevail against America. He said that the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. That's a hard truth. It's a very, very hard truth, especially in the polarization, uh, the polarized political landscape that we have right now. We think that it's brother against brother, conservative against liberal, pro this candidate, pro that candidate. But all you have to be is pro-Catholic, pro-life, pro-God. Because that's what rendering unto Caesar means. It means that we respect the lawful authorities in our life. We pray for them. We sacrifice for them. We honor God by listening. By listening. I didn't say acting on what they do. I said listen. Listen and see, does this conform to my Catholic faith? Because I'm a Catholic first, an American second, or a Roman second, or a Venetian second, or a Cameroonian second, an Ar Arkansasian second, Kentuckian second. Our Catholic faith means more to us, and that's why Jesus tells us you have to render to God what is God's. But what's beautiful, absolutely amazing, absolutely awesome, is that God can write straight with crooked lines. God can use imperfect instruments to accomplish his will. You and I are examples of that. I am not worthy to be called a disciple of Christ, let alone a priest. How humbling it is to be called mother, father, husband, wife. That God has asked us to respond yes to our vocation. God writes straight, straight with crooked lines all the time. And he usually picks the lowly and humble servants to do the greatest tasks. So if you feel tested in this political landscape, in your American Catholicism, don't be conflicted. The answer is to fulfill your vocation by rendering to God what is God's. And King Cyrus, in our first reading, he was a non-believer. The prophet Isaiah actually says this. He says that God spoke to King Cyrus, Cyrus of Persia, not a Jewish king, a Persian king. God said, I have called you by name, given a title, though you knew not God. I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. It is I. Through you, people will know me. So that the rising of the sun and the rising and setting of the sun, people may know that there is no other God but me. I am the Lord and there is no other. How many times God has humbled us by saying exactly that, 
by the imperfect authority above us, whether it's your boss at work, all the way up to the president, all the way up to the Holy Father. I am the Lord thy God. There is no other. This is why Jesus told Pontius Pilate, a very imperfect instrument, who accomplished God's plan, he said, you would have no authority if it were not given to you. If I were to call down the angels, they would come to my rescue right now. But that's not God's will. So your authority is given from above. You think you're high and mighty, but I am the Lord thy God. There is no other. There is no God above him. So God shows that his plan of salvation, the fact that his divine providence has seen all of this and is guiding all of this, no matter how big the mess, God's pretty good with messes. He's actually great in messes. In God's plan of salvation, even people that do not know him or believe in him can be used for the salvation of this world can be used to accomplish the plan of God. That's why they need our prayers, whoever they are. Your boss all the way up to the Holy Father. It doesn't matter. Anybody with authority has a heavy burden and they need prayers. They need sacrifices. For each one of us, this is a hard teaching to render to God what is God's and render to Caesar what is Caesar's. Because Caesar is imperfect, but God is always perfect. God doesn't make mistakes. He is unchangeable, and he loves us with that enduring love. So for us, when we listen to those authority figures, we have to see, does this conform to my Catholic faith, to the catechism of the Catholic Church and divine revelation? Because there is a difference between foundational issues and secondary issues, right? Especially when we're voting. Foundational issues are life. When life is attacked through abortion and euthanasia, when the mar marriage is under attack, when the family is under attack, when our religious liberty is under attack, our Catholic faith is under attack, those are foundational issues. Secondary issues would be tax reform or criminal justice or environmental protection and policies, procedures, whatever you want to call them. Those are secondary issues. So if you think of it as a house, some issues are on the foundational level, which if the foundation is cracked, the house falls down. Other issues are like the walls of your house. Non-load-bearing walls can be taken out and you can open your room. That's what we call remodeling those can change. That's a beautiful thing. Or you put up walls because you've had more children. They need smaller spaces because they'll kill each other if I don't put smaller spaces. Walls, secondary issues. But if your foundation is cracked, if there is problems, the house will fall down and your kids won't have a roof over your head, nor will you. Foundational issues change the nature of that house. Secondary issues do not. This is what we have to discern. This is why our Catholic faith is so important. And that's why we have to know our faith, love our faith, go deeper in our faith. Each one of us is called, as St. Paul tells us in our second reading, we, are, we have to have that work of faith, the labor of love, the endurance in hope, because you have been chosen this is why Pope Benedict XVI, he said, while we, while, we must, sorry, while we must always be committed to the improvement of the world, tomorrow's better world cannot be the proper and sufficient content of our hope. While tomorrow's world is important, it cannot be our proper and sufficient content of our hope. So these are, these are super important because, as the Second Vatican Council tells us, without the Creator, the creature vanishes. And we see this happening. When we forget God, the creatures of God go mad. 
This is where we get these offenses against life and against the dignity of the human person with the transgender movement or with questioning our DNA, the God-given image and likeness that he has given to us. So St. Paul tells the Thessalonians who were fearful of the future, they didn't know when Jesus was coming back to judge the living and the dead. They thought it was going to happen today. They thought it was happening tomorrow. So what do we do, St. Paul? What do we do? How many of us are trying to preserve our life, trying our best to control what is to come? Fear-mongering, even, to the point of saying, did you hear this Catholic gossip? Did you hear about this seer? Did you see this? Did you hear about that thing, this thing, that thing? I gave a homily a couple years ago about people who had uh, grapes in a jar on top of their refrigerator for 25 years because somebody told them one time after Mass that if they have grapes in a jar in this wine, that they will survive the three days of darkness. The hard truth, that's superstition. That's against the first commandment. That's scary that somebody is proliferating superstition under the guise that it's Catholic. When we attribute power to things rather than God, that is superstition. And that even goes for some sacramentals. People panic, panic, because they're not wearing 75 scapulars and they don't have every single medal that the Catholic Church has ever put out in their pockets and they tied their shoes in a rabbit's knot rather than, you know, just uh, tying a double knot. I don't know. You know, they have to do a fisherman's knot with all of their ropes because Pedro in Argentina told me that if you do that, you're a true Catholic. Huh? What? I don't remember seeing that in the Bible. I don't remember seeing that in the catechism. Foundational issues versus secondary issues. Now, please don't get me wrong. Obviously, I love sacramentals. I'm wearing about three of them right now. Praise God. Big fan of the miraculous medal, St. Benedict medal, your rosary, everything and anything that the Lord wanted to tell us. I love it. I love it. But I love it because of the Lord, not because of the thing. Not because of that magical talisman, it would be the equivalent of having a Catholic rabbit's foot. My trust is in the Lord. Our trust is in the Lord. But this is the panic that sometimes permeates good Catholics, loving Catholics, Sunday Catholics. We're fearful, but yet Jesus has promised us, do not worry about what you are to eat and what you are to wear. God will provide He says over and over, have no fear. Fear is from the devil. Fear is from the devil. Now the fear of God, that is a gift, of course, of the Holy Spirit. But that means having the holy reverence for God, that he is God and I am not. The beautiful thing is that St. Paul urges us today in our second reading, just as he urged the Thess- those from Thessalonica, the church in Thessalonica, he tells the Thessalonians, we give thanks to God always for all of you, remembering you in our prayers. Ooh, the P word again. Remembering you in our prayers, unceasingly calling to mind your work of faith, and labor of love and endurance and hope of our Lord Jesus Christ before our God and Father, knowing, brothers and sisters, who are loved by God, how you were chosen at your baptism. God chose you. For our gospel did not come to you in word alone, but in the power, in power and in the Holy Spirit and with much conviction. I love fervent Catholics. I want to be one someday when I grow up in faith and endure in hope and labor in love. I'm trying. You're trying. But it should not cause us fear. 
Living out our vocation is a calling from God, and that means that God is giving you the grace right here, right now, to be the best husband and father you can be, the best wife and mother you can be, the best child of God that you can be, honoring your father and mother, keeping the commandments, loving God. This is what it's all about. Working in faith, laboring in love, enduring in hope. That's our calling. So our calling is very simple. It's difficult. It's still a cross because everybody's against us. But yet we need to band together, not cause more divisions. We need to unite in love and faith and hope. We need to support one another by prayer and sacrifice, especially our authority figures. So we don't want to test God anymore. We don't want to say, will you save America? Will you take care of us? We have to trust and say, Lord, I know you. In faith and conviction, I know you will take care of us. I don't know what that means. It may mean that there will be a St. Andy who was martyred because some crazy person decides that he hates the Catholic faith and wants to kill priests. I don't know if that's in God's will. Please, God, that's a golden ticket to heaven. Big fan of that. But I don't know God's will for the future. But I do know God's will right now. He's calling us, all of us, to daily prayer, fulfilling our daily duties, and daily persevering in our faith, our Catholic faith, which is one holy apostolic Catholic. So today as we receive Jesus, let that be our prayer, Lord. Let us work in faith. Let us labor in love. Let us endure in the hope, knowing that you have the will and power to transform our lives on a daily basis and to bring me to heaven according to your most holy providence. But he doesn't leave us alone. He comes to us each and every time you come to Mass. Every day, if you wish, and your schedule permits it, you can be united to the Lord Jesus Christ the rock and refuge in our time of need, our shelter in storms so that the wind and rain do not affect you, you are set firmly on Jesus Christ, the rock, the rock of the church. So let us ask Jesus to supply our need, to help us to persevere, help us to endure in hope, labor in love, and keep the faith so as to run this race, so to win, win, that heavenly glory that God has in store for you and me since the day of our baptism. What a beautiful gift our Catholic faith is. So praise be Jesus Christ, now and forever.